right, hi everybody. This is going to be our last video <clears throat> for the heart chapter. And um, so last time we finished up by talking about the ECG and some of the features of the ECG. And so now we're gonna move on to the cardiac cycle. All right, so the cardiac cycle is just the cycle of the heart contracting and relaxing over and over again. All right, but we're gonna break it down into all of its wonderful detailed um, parts. Okay, so first of all, let's start off by defining uh, two really key terms that we're gonna be using over and over. The first one is systole. And so systole, refer, I'm just gonna write the word systole over again. No, refers to contraction. All right, so systole is contraction. So you can have um, atrial systole, ventricular systole, um, if, you know, just depending on which one is contracting. And then diastole refers to relaxation. All right, so when they relax uh, after a contraction. Okay, and so again, you can have atrial diastole and ventricular diastole, just when they uh, relax. So a really important thing to note about diastole is that this is the time specifically when the myocardium uh, gets nourished. Okay, so this is the time when that oxygen from the coronary blood flow and the nutrition, the, you know, the glucose and all that good stuff can actually be sent into those um, muscle cells. That's during diastole. So having a, you know, decent amount of time for diastole is critically important to um, the heart health and being able to function. Okay, and so when we talk about the cardiac cycle, you can think of one beat of the heart consists of the heart contracting, right, and then relaxing. So when we're talking about this, we're typically with systole and diastole, when they're just used it as, you know, individual words, they're going to refer to the ventricles, all right, and so the duration of a heartbeat would be the ventricles contracting and then relaxing, all right? So that would just be one cardiac cycle, all right? So one bout of those ventricles contracting and relaxing. All right, so we can also calculate beat duration and um, you need to understand this concept, but on your exam, I'm not gonna have you do calculations on the actual exam, but this concept is something you should be able to um, understand how you know these equations work. All right, so for beat duration, we can calculate it, all right? So we'll just say beat duration again. by taking uh, 60 and dividing it by the heart rate, which is gonna be in beats per minute, okay? And so, um, heart rate. And so dividing 60 by that will cancel out, you know, the minutes because there's, uh, you know, 60 seconds in a minute. And so that will give us just how long an actual single beat of the heart is, okay? So let's do kind of a typical example, all right? So if we take someone whose heart rate is maybe 75 beats per minute, all right? Uh, and we plug that into our equation, so it would be 60 divided by 75, and that would come out to be 0.8 seconds, all right? So one beat of the heart would be 0 0.8 seconds, all right? So a little less than a second for a kind of an average heart rate of about 75 beats per minute. Okay, good. So now when we're talking about kind of these different stages of the cardiac cycle with ventricular diastole and systole and the different events that are happening. We're gonna talk about the valves opening and closing. We're gonna look at these graphs, all right? And so these graphs might be a little intimidating, but I'm just gonna kind of tell you what they are really quick, okay? So the purple one on the very top, right? So this one here that we're looking at is just showing the pressure in the ventricles, all right? And so, it should make some logical sense 
when the ventricles are going to contract, that pressure is going to increase, all right? And then when they relax, that pressure will fall back down, okay? So ventricles contract and they relax, all right? That's all we're looking at on the first line. And then in the second line, we have the volume of blood in the ventricles. And so it kind of looks a little bit the opposite of the pressure because when those ventricles contract, they're going to be pushing blood out. So that volume is going to go down. And when they relax, those ventricles are going to start refilling with blood. Okay. And so then it'll just keep doing that. Right. So the ventricles contract to push blood out. So the volume goes down and they relax to refill with blood. So the volume goes back up. All right, and then you should be familiar with the uh, ECG we talked about last time, so our P wave, QRS complex, and our T waves. And then this phonocardiogram just shows you where those heart sounds are occurring. So this would be that first heart sound, and this would be the second heart sound. So the lub and the dub, over and over. All right, so let's talk about the different events that are going to occur. So let's start here, and we'll kind of move back up to the chart and look at it. All right, so the first kind of series of events are gonna be associated with ventricular diastole. All right, so we're gonna start with diastole. So the ventricles are relaxing, all right? And so when the ventricles relax, they're gonna fill with blood, okay? And so uh, at the in the initial portion of this, the atria are not really contracting, they're gonna be relaxed and the ventricles are in the process of relaxing and opening up to accept all that blood, okay? And so that is gonna be referred to as passive filling, all right? Uh, and so if we look here, so diastole, ventricular diastole would be occurring between these two lines, all right? So this would be the area we're talking about. Okay, all right, and so during this time, there is a special event called isovolumetric relaxation, all right? And so with isovolumetric relaxation, this is the point in time during the cardiac cycle when all valves are closed. There's gonna be two moments like this, all right? So all valves are closed. All right, we'll talk about why the all valves would be closed at this time. Uh, and so the reason all the valves are closed is that the ventricles uh, have not yet relaxed enough uh, to open those AV valves, all right? And then obviously the semilunar valves are gonna be closed um, because the pressure in the ventricles is lower than in those big blood vessels, all right? But the ventricles, uh, have not relaxed enough to open the AV valves. Okay, so that's um, this point, AV valves, that we can see on this chart, all right? And that is gonna be right here, right? So this line here, would represent, and it's a very short period of time because time is on our x-axis, right? So it's really a very brief time where the AV valves and the semilunar valves are both closed, okay? So this is the point here where the semilunar valves close, and this is the point here where that AV valve opens. Okay, so the pressure in the ventricles is low enough to be below the pressure of the atria, and then those AV valves would open. Okay, and so then the semilunar valves, all right, whoops, will open up here, and then the AV will close here. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So this point here on this line, I'll kind of, here we go, I can kind of color this in here. All right, so this point from here to here is isovolumetric relaxation because the ventricles are relaxing, right? This is occurring during diastole, 
All right, so that's one way you can remember that. So isovolumetric relaxation occurs during diastole. All right, and that's when all of the valves are closed. Okay, and so then also during <clears throat> ventricular diastole, we have this time of passive filling for the heart. All right, so 70 to 80% of the filling of those ventricles is gonna occur passively. All right, so that just means that the pressure in the ventricles is lower than the pressure in the atria. So that AV valve opens, and then that um, blood just moves from high to low pressure um, from the atrium into the ventricle, all right? And so there's no contraction of the atria at this point, all right? So the atria haven't contracted. That's why it's passive, all right? So that blood is just moving from high to low pressure from the atria to the ventricle. All right, no contraction from the atria yet. Okay, and so that would be when we're looking at our graph. All right, we said, you know, we're looking at the volume on this middle kind of green line. All right, so we have our ventricles are relaxing. So then they're starting to fill with blood. So this first segment here, that's gonna be passive filling, all right? And so that's about 70 to 80% and it's done without the uh, atria contracting, all right? So then for that last little bit, that will occur during atrial systole, all right? That'll correspond with the P wave of our, um, shortly after that P wave of our ECG, all right? So this will also cause an increase in atrial pressure. All right, and that is going to pump that remaining 30, 20 to 30% into uh, the ventricles. All right, so this will pump remaining uh, 20 to 30%, okay? And so this atrial systole will start once the ventricles have completely relaxed, all right? So we need those ventricles to be totally relaxed so they can uh, receive that blood from the atria, okay? So that's atrial systole, pumping that last 30%. You can actually see that here. So we have our passive filling for the majority of it, and then this last little bit of filling right here, all right? So this little segment, that will be from atrial systole, squeezing out that last little bit of volume into the ventricles, okay? So then after the ventricles have completely filled with blood, now it is their time to contract, all right? And that'll put us in uh, ventricular systole, okay? So during ventricular systole, the ventricles contract, all right? That's gonna cause an increase in pressure in those ventricles. And so if we look at this picture, we can see that, all right? So here, this would be systole, all right? So the pressure is increasing as those ventricles are contracting, all right? So this segment from this line over to this one would be systole, all right? So the pressure in the ventricles is gonna increase. During uh, ventricular systole, we have another moment where all of the valves are closed, all right? So this is all valves closed. So it's happening during systole, so this one's called isovolumetric contraction, okay? And so the reason all the valves are closed is because the ventricles uh, have not contracted enough to open uh, that semilunar valve. All right, I have not contracted enough to open the semilunar valves. All right, and so we can see that if we look back up on our graph up here, and I'll kind of highlight it for you. All right, you can see that section here, right? So our semilunar valves haven't opened yet and our AV valves have closed. So this would be isovolumetric contraction. 
All right, that'll be right there. Okay. And that will happen during ventricular systole. Okay. And then lastly, uh, we have with our uh, cardiac cycle, the ejection phase. And so this is just that time when the blood uh, is forced out of the ventricles. All right, so blood forced from ventricles. And so on our graph up here, we'll see that the volume of blood will dip quickly during this time, right? So this would be our ejection phase here, okay? So we're just forcing the blood out of the ventricles. All right, so that is the cardiac cycle, and then we will go back to ventricular diastole. The uh, ventricles will start to re relax after they have um, contracted, okay? All right, uh, and so, with the cardiac cycle, one other calculation you should be aware of, uh, and conceptually this is very important, is that you can calculate the length of the cardiac cycle. All right, so cardiac cycle length is really just equal to the time spent in diastole, all right, plus the time spent in systole. Okay, and so what an important concept to understand is that systole, the time it takes for the heart to actually contract and push blood uh, out, remains constant at right around 0 0.3 seconds. Okay, and so then um, as you increase the heart rate, right, and that cardiac cycle has less time to complete itself, so if we let's say, you know, had 0.8 seconds would be a normal heartbeat, all right? You would just take that, insert that 0 0.8 seconds here, all right? That is gonna be equal to diastole plus systole, which we already know. And so then we could just subtract 0.3 from our 0.8, and then that would make diastole 0.5 seconds. Okay, and so the shorter each beat of the heart is, as your heart starts to beat faster, if you're like exercising uh, or something like that, that just means that there's less time for diastole. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind because systole is constant. All right, so this is constant. And you should know that in this number, all right? So systole is constant at about 0 0.3 seconds, all right? And when you uh, increase the heart rate, that will shorten the length of the cardiac cycle and leave less time for diastole, all right? That time when the heart actually gets nourished. So that's an important thing to understand. Okay, so let's talk about a couple volumes associated with the cardiac cycle. So we have the end diastolic volume, okay? So the kind of the name tells you what it is. So the volume of blood at the end of diastole. So this is the volume the ventricles can hold. All right. All right, so when they're fully relaxed at the end of diastole uh, and atrial systole, so we've pumped that last 30%, uh, that volume is the end diastolic volume. All right, sorry, I just realized I had that kind of bar across the screen at the bottom. I don't think it obscured very much, but um, I fixed that now. All right, so uh, end diastolic volume, so that's the volume in the ventricles uh, after they've relaxed completely and completely filled with blood. So how much blood can they hold? That's end diastolic volume. And then there's end systolic volume, which will tell us um, the volume of blood left after contraction, all right? So blood left after contraction. And there is some blood left in the ventricles after contraction, all right? But as if the heart, for some reason, is pumping less efficiently, that in systolic volume will decrease, all right? So that could be something to be concerned about. So it's a good number to look at to kind of tell you how uh, effectively and efficiently the heart is pumping, okay? 
And so in our last video, we talked about fibrillation and how it's uncoordinated contraction of the heart. All right, and so let's specifically talk about atrial versus ventricular fibrillation. All right, so atrial fibrillation is when just the atria are contracting in an uncoordinated way. All right, and so this can often go undetected because the ventricles can still fill that 70%, all right? So they can still fill 70%, right? So that would be the amount um, without that additional contraction from the atria, okay? So even if the atria aren't functioning properly, um, you can still circulate a fair amount of blood, all right? So uh, often this goes undetected for that reason. versus ventricular fibrillation um, would be very apparent because the blood is not being pumped at all, all right? So if the ventricles are fibrillating, V-fib, all right, the blood is not being pumped. And this would be life-threatening, all right? And so this would be a case where somebody would need to be defibrillated, all right, shocked to kind of reset that um, pumping of the heart, okay. All right, so now let's talk about cardiac output, okay? And so with cardiac output, uh, this is how much blood, all right? So by definition, cardiac output is uh, the blood pumped in one minute, all right? So pumped by the heart in one minute. Okay, and so you can calculate uh, cardiac output by taking the stroke volume, all right? So the stroke volume is the volume moved during one contraction, okay? So when the heart contracts, the ventricle contracts, um, the stroke volume is how much blood it's moving at that particular time, okay? So to do cardiac output, you can take that stroke volume, multiply it by the heart rate, so how many beats in a minute, and that will give you the average blood being pumped every minute. And so on average, it's around five liters a minute, okay? And so if you kind of think about it, we talked about the in diastolic volume, in systolic volume just a second ago. So the amount of blood in the ventricles would be equal to that amount that was pumped out, the stroke volume, and the amount remaining in the ventricles after it's contracted, the in systolic volume. Okay, so they're all kind of related numbers. All right. Okay, and so... Um, if we kind of were looking at, there we go. If we're looking at this chart, all right, and so we can um, see that the, let me get my pen back here, right? So the end diastolic volume would be this volume. Whoops, change the eraser, right? So here, this would be end diastolic volume. Okay, and then when the heart contracts, this would be the end systolic volume. So that's the amount of blood left in the ventricles uh, after contraction. And then the amount of the blood actually contracted that's moved out during contraction here, that would be the stroke volume, okay? All right, and so then our last topic for this chapter uh, is gonna be how we can alter cardiac output, all right? So we know, so in a minute, approximately, your heart can move about five liters of blood. But we know during exercise and that sort of thing that you can increase that amount, okay? And so let's talk about that. All right, and so a word for that, all right, is cardiac reserve. So cardiac reserve is just a term that refers to how much the cardiac output can be increased, all right? And so that would be beyond 
rest. Okay, so how much can you increase cardiac output beyond rest? And so um, in the people who are, you know, just the average person, not extremely athletic, right? Not necessarily a couch potato, but uh, in a, norm <clears throat> a normal non-athlete, that cardiac output can be increased four to five times, right? And uh, much more than that for people who are very, very athletic, okay? All right, so let's talk about ways to do that. Okay, so if we remember this equation, our end diastolic volume is equal to stroke volume times the, or plus the end systolic volume, all right? So if we want to increase our um, cardiac output, all right, we could increase our end diastolic volume. So just the amount of blood that can be held by those ventricles, all right? So that's gonna be the first way that we'll talk about. And so we can do that one by altering preload, okay? And so preload is just the stretch on the ventricles, right? So we can stretch the ventricles more, right? And putting, allowing more blood to go in. And so there's a, an associated law with this. This is the Frank Starling law, all right? So, and that states that increasing stretch that's of the ventricles will increase stroke volume. Okay, so they're connected. So as we increase stretch, that puts more blood in the ventricles, that will increase stroke volume, the amount, the amount of blood that's gonna be pushed out uh, when those ventricles contract, okay? So in addition to changing the preload and increasing that preload, the stretch on the ventricles, we can also alter venous return, all right? So this is the amount of blood returning to the heart. Okay. So that's gonna be preload, the blood being returned to the heart, all right? Or sorry, venous return. That's the amount of blood being returned to the heart. And so when you increase the return, that venous return, that is going to increase preload, okay? And then as we said, that will increase stroke volume and that will increase cardiac output, okay? And so one, so one way to do this uh, through exercise, right? Remember, skeletal muscle milking helps to squeeze on veins to push blood back towards the heart. So when you're exercising, you're actually gonna be increasing that venous return by just through the skeletal muscle milking that's happening. All right, so increasing skeletal muscle milking. Okay. So that's gonna be by increasing in diastolic volume. Then we can also go by, affect this by decreasing the in systolic volume. All right, and so we can do this uh, one by increasing the contractility of the heart, right? Just making it contract more forcefully, all right? So this is how forcefully the heart contracts. Okay, and so if we want to push more blood out with each contraction, uh, we want to increase that contractility, make it contract more forcefully, okay? And so there are um, agents that'll do this. So one, the sympathetic nervous system will do this, all right? Sympathetic nervous system and epinephrine uh, will increase contractility, okay? As will um, positive ionotropic agents, okay? And so actually epinephrine is one of those positive uh, ionotropic agents, all right? But there are a couple others. Um, so calcium is also a positive ionotropic agent. And in addition to calcium, there is a drug called digitalis. It's actually a plant, all right? Digitalis 
that can uh, have the same effect of increasing contractility. Okay, so you can increase co contractility or you can decrease the afterload, all right? So the afterload is the pressure uh, in the major vessels that leave the heart, all right? So in the vessels leaving the heart. Okay, so that would be like the, the aorta and that pulmonary trunk. So if you decrease that pressure that the ventricle has to push against, then that is going to help to make it easier for the ventricle to push out more blood, right? It doesn't have to work quite as hard, okay? So hypertension, which is high blood pressure, this actually would counteract that, right? So this would increase afterload. Okay, so this, uh, so hypertension might make it a little more difficult for somebody to increase their cardiac output. Okay, our last topic is going to be just a couple um, ways to regulate heart rate. Okay, and so some of these you should already be familiar with. Um, so one of the major centers for regulating heart rate is going to be in the medulla. All right, so in the medulla there are cardiac centers. All right, that are going to help to monitor heart rate. Okay, and so then you also learned in ANP1 that the sympathetic nervous system uh, can function to increase heart rate through the release of epinephrine. All right, among uh, you know many other effects, that's one of the things it does. And so this would happen by uh, acting on that SA and the AV nodes, right? Those pacemaker nodes. So they would alter the rates of those pacemaker nodes. Okay, and then the parasympathetic nervous system can also um, alter those, um, those pacemakers, right? They're just going to have the opposite effect. So this would decrease heart rate. Okay, and so the parasympathetic nervous system acts through acetylcholine, which hopefully you learned in AP1 versus the sympathetic nervous system, which acts through epinephrine. Okay. All right, so then there are also some hormones that can have effects on um, heart rate. So epinephrine is a hormone, right, but um, that affects heart rate. Also, thyroid hormone will um, increase heart rate as well. There are ions that will increase heart rate. So an increase in potassium ions uh, will decrease the heart rate, all right? Because potassium will actually hyperpolarize the action potential in those cells, all right? Making it harder for them to reach threshold. So that will cause um, a decrease in heart rate, all right? So this would be called hyperkalemia. All right, so hyperkalemia would be elevated levels of potassium in the blood, and that will decrease heart rate. Okay, and so then also an increase in calcium can have an effect on heart rate. All right, so an increase in calcium will increase heart rate. Okay, and it does that by um, increasing the contractility of the heart. All right. And then lastly, we have a category of um, molecules called positive chronotropic factors, okay? So positive ionotropic factors or agents um, increased contractility. Positive chronotropic factors are going to increase heart rate. All right, so these are things that increase heart rate. So a few examples uh, would be atropine, uh, dopamine actually increases heart rate as well. Uh, so a lot of times if you watch like medical dramas when they're trying to restart someone's heart, uh, they'll push dopamine uh, in addition to epinephrine, all right? And that's because it's a positive uh, chronotropic factor. Epinephrine, okay? All right, so that is it for the heart chapter. 
Um, go ahead and make sure you're studying and preparing for your exam. Uh, and I will talk to you guys for our next chapter on blood vessels.